Chad is going to read us something, is that right? Yeah, and this, this just uh, came up the other day when, when you were talking about questions and how uh, uh, you like to just usually kind of flow along so that, and a lot of times the questions kind of um, resolve themselves. So this is a um, uh, 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 quote from Rilke, so it might be familiar to a lot of you. It's from the, his letters to a, a young poet. Um, let's see. Uh, I would like to beg you, dear sir, as well as I can, to have patience with everything unresolved in your heart, and to try to love the questions themselves as if they were locked rooms or books written in a very foreign language. Don't search for the answers which could not be given to you now, because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps then, someday far in the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answer. Beautiful. Yeah, that's terrific, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, spot on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, after that, of course, it's quite difficult to say we now don't have questions, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, here we go. Um, I'm just really interested, Henry, in in language. I'm trying to bring all of this to terms with our use of language. And earlier you said something, um, when you give something a name, you've stopped experiencing it. And that makes... That makes sense to me, but I also am trying to. Um, I understand that this isn't a project of trying to throw out language altogether or throw out expression of our experience, but I can see how that does bring us further downstream. So I'm wondering if you have insight into bringing our language or our poetry, our description upstream or. If you could just talk to that a bit, I, I haven't quite worked it out in my mind. I'm not even sure what I'm asking. I just yeah, if yeah. you want to talk about that. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, it, it's very fundamental, <clears throat> as you probably know. 20th century was a century in which people were very much obsessed with language and philosophy. <clears throat> the thing is, there's two sides to language, um, and most of the time I concentrate on the other side. That one. It is true that with language. Um, at a certain point, you give it something a name, that can sort of stop it. But <clears throat> in living language, in the lived experience of language, it isn't like that. And very often, uh, it's, it's to do more with what's sometimes called, there's a difference between language as representation, in which you apply a name to something, but you focus more on the name than the thing itself, and language as expression. The problem with the word expression is we too easily fall into thinking of it as self-expression. It's not self-expression. It's something coming to expression in language that will involve yourself, but it's not primarily about expressing yourself. And this is a problem I have with the word expression. Having cleared that out of the way, uh, we can see that... Um, let's supposing... <coughs> and it can happen with quite simple things... Let's, well, it doesn't happen now because of emails, of course, but <coughs> in the past there have been times when I've had to write a letter to someone. Um, someone's written to me and they've said something or whatever, and there comes a point when I have to write a letter to them. And I sort of know what it is that I want to write to them. So it's fairly easy. I get a sheet of paper and I start writing. And then I discover that as my pen goes to the paper, that it seems to have sort of disappeared. And I can't quite get it. And I scratch around and I fumble around and so on and that. And there can come a moment when suddenly it says, it says, it's almost like it says itself, that's what I wanted to say. That's it. Now you all know this experience in one form or another. Now, that's a very interesting thing to say. That's what I wanted to say. Well, in that case, then, why didn't you say it? 
What was the problem? Uh, the problem is that things are, come when they come into expression, it's that that expression itself is a further stage of the meaning in which it now comes into a, a, into a, a definite form in which uh, it, it becomes explicit and we can see it. And it's as if it's to say, now I know what it is I wanted to say. Um, now what that means is, it wasn't there beforehand, yet it must have been in some sense there beforehand, because you knew you wanted to write a letter and you felt that it was there beforehand. So you wanted to, to do this, it was there somehow or other, but it wasn't there fully formed before. It hadn't come out into, form, into expression beforehand. Um, and of course, once you've done this, people then can go into the... So one of the mistakes people have is thinking that um, on the one side, um, we already know things before we say them. And then we just put them into words. Um, I, all this stuff I've been doing this week, I know all of that. I've been sitting here just putting it into words for you. Well, that's rubbish. It's been coming to expression as we've been doing it. But we, we do very quickly, once something has been said, once we focus on what is said, it then seems that we have the meaning and we just apply the words to it. We now, at that point, recognise that it wasn't that way around. It was through the words that the meaning came. But when we say that, we then fall to the other extreme and say, oh, are you saying that the words produce the meaning? that it, they made the meaning up and that the meaning is simply a consequence of the words. No, that's the opposite extreme. It's the meaning, there is the meaning there, but it has not come into expression. When it comes into expression, it comes into being as an articulate mode of itself and you can see, ah, that's it. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that the words produce it in the sense of make it, manufacture it. So both these two extremes, I, I think of it, it's like walking on a tightrope. The greatest possibility, if I were to try walking on a tightrope, is I would injure myself. Uh, but I would fall, fall off on one side or the other, and that's what language is like. On one side we fall off into thinking that the, uh, that the meaning was there in advance, and we just represented it in language. On the other side, we fall off into thinking that the language itself produces the meaning, makes it. And we didn't have that before, it's a product of the language. On the tightrope, we see these opposites are, in a sense, both true. Again, we have this, this paradox where these opposites are actually both simultaneously true. So, uh, if you hold those two together, you get, you get a sense of it, and it's dynamic. But once the meaning's been said, it then becomes, as sometimes said, becomes, it, it becomes institutional. And most language has become institutional. But you then can use that language to say things which are completely new. We use the old words to say things which are new. It's a miracle, actually. Um, but what matters is the expression. And we don't have that expression in advance. And yet we are in contact with it, or we would not be trying to bring something to expression. Does that help you? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's it's very dynamic. It's organic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, I've been troubled <coughs> by something during the week, and um, at the risk of going a little outside of what you've been speaking on, coming to the college here for me, um, I'm. I'm struck by the distinction that yourself and Stefan keep referring to of this meaning as if life itself has intrinsic meaning. And um, whether we're talking about the meaning um, in the sense of, you know, the not transformed meaning and the meaning in seeing meaning perception model that you've been sharing with us. I'd just like to ask you to comment on um, meaninglessness, or meaningless. I guess for myself, I come from a world view um, of life itself being meaningless. Please don't shoot me to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I won't do that. I, I'm asking, um, 
You know, meaning to me is a human construct. And um, I'd like you to comment on meaninglessness. Well, it's very difficult because um, the problem is, is the first of all, meaning tends to get used in different ways. Yes. And I'm using the word meaning in a very down-to-earth way. And very often people want to use it in a higher kind of way, which doesn't even cross my mind. People talk about the search for meaning, and they obviously mean something by that, but I'm not talking about the search for meaning. I'm interested uh, in the sense when they say, oh, we live in a meaningless world now, we live in a meaningless world, and so on and that. And obviously people have this experience. But that refers to something specific at a specific level. Um, in fact, it's not a meaningless world, because if it were, they would not be able to say, we live in a meaningless world. It's because it's already meaningful they can even say that. And apparently mean something by it. And what I'm, what I'm focused on is, is the meaning which is inescapable. So if we were to try to escape from that meaning, uh, what would we find? Well, we would find ourselves in a completely chaotic state. <clears throat> we wouldn't actually know, not only would we not know what anything was, we, we would not know who we were or even that we were a who. There would, we would lose uh, all this experience. Um, now I've written about this in that, that wretched book I wrote, it's come back to me. Um, uh, yeah, in the third part, I've forgotten about this. Um, the, the, for example, let me go back. There are states which approximate to meaninglessness, and they can be quite frightening. Um, I, I, I um, remember, it happened to me several times when I was in my 20s, falling asleep. It must have happened to you. Falling asleep and waking up and being completely detached from everything. So, although I was in a room, I didn't know that I was in a room. And I didn't know that I was an I in a room. There were, uh, that doesn't mean that everything was uniform. There were, there were differences. But there was no distinction. Mm -hmm. So they could not say table, chair, book, so on, me. There was just, imagine that from which all concepts are being withdrawn whatsoever. And then you will get to a state of meaninglessness. Mm -hmm. It is not very nice. There are also, I did quite a lot of exploration of this because there are anaesthetics that produce this effect in people. And at one time I had to go into hospital regularly for a series of minor operations in which they gave me a lovely combination of things. I've got it written down somewhere. Um, and um, anyway, the point about this combination of things, whatever it was, is you thought you'd gone to sleep, but you hadn't. It interfered with the mind in such a way that all concepts were withdrawn. So you went into a state of complete conceptlessness, a okay. state of such meaninglessness, you didn't even know that you were there experiencing, because you didn't know that you were a you. Mm -hmm. Some of you may have had this experience. Consequently, they could do nasty things to you without you realizing. You know, she knows. <laughs> I, I've seen someone in this situation. In that state, yeah. Now, that's the state of meaninglessness. And I used to experience this, um, and so on. And uh, they used to apologise to me, because this was a regular occurrence, and say, you know, we're awfully sorry about this. I said, oh, don't worry, don't worry at all. I'm actually using this for research into epistemology, <laughs> which actually quite tickled the doctor, I must admit. They <laughs> didn't normally get patients who talked about, we used words like epistemology, but uh, they could sort of see the point. So that, and I've got a feeling that I've written about this. And could I just reach over? I'll try not to stand on all the chocolate. And if I could just reach over here. Uh, 
And the third part of this book, you see, I wrote this so many years ago, I've forgotten what I've written, but I might be able to find it. Uh, you just have to bear with me for a minute. Because <coughs> here I talked about the organising idea, but uh, I wouldn't use that phrase now, I don't think. Um, I'm more interested in going to. Let me just see this. There is a strongly prevailing prejudice, usually associated with the empiricist frame of mind, in favour of the idea that direct apprehension of the world would be achieved by pure sense perception. This state is taken to be one which is achieved by taking away all conceptualization, as if ideas formed a film between us and reality, which stops us from seeing what is really there in itself then it is believed we would see reality directly. And then I've gone into one reason for that prejudice there. Um, one, one, sorry, one reason for this prejudice has already been indicated above. We tend to think of an idea as a kind of mental entity, like a mental picture or image. Whereas we should really think of an idea as the act of conceiving. In reference to Brentano. Brentano, who taught us all, said, by idea, I mean the act of conceiving, not that which is conceived. Mm -hmm. Upstream. Mm -hmm. And in this book, I do the same upstream, downstream thing, but I do it in terms of the word idea from Brentano. I say, if you want to read this chapter, you, you'll find in this chapter, it is, I'll tell you where it is, it's called The Organising Idea in Cognitive Perception. It's chapter 2 of the third part of the book. It starts on page 123. And it does what I was doing on seeing, only in the earlier part of this book, which was written 10 years before the second part, what I actually did here... Um, oh, Lord. I've got... I just found this. In here... Oh, I'm found this. Come on, you can do it. Um, yes, in here... What Goethe's scientific consciousness, the monograph, I did it there, or about there, I did it here in terms of meaning directly. Um, and I talked about this, I, I simply talked about it in terms of meaning. This is not the meaning of what is seen, but the meaning which is what is seen. And then, in 1986, I did it in terms of meaning. Then in 1996, I did it in terms of the, organized, the notion of an organising idea, because I was working from Brentano, who used the word idea. Y you can do it either way. Now I did it in terms of meaning, because I think in terms of the early Heidegger and the later Wittgenstein and Merleau-Ponty, that's actually a better way of doing it. So I've got, because this, this does, this has been found to be very useful, the organising idea by people, but it, it does have certain connotations, which I wouldn't, never mind. Mental pictures and images can come between us and what is there. But the idea is in fact the act of seeing what is there. Far from coming between us and some supposed external reality, the idea, understood as the act of conceiving, is the direct apprehension of what is there. To illustrate that our perception of reality <coughs> is, is normally direct, David Best considers the example of looking at a chessboard. This... This would, not, this would not be seen more directly by someone from a society in which the game of chess was unknown, as the pure perception theorists would have us believe. Such a person could not see the chess ball more directly than a person from a chess-playing society. In fact, people from a society where chess was unknown could not see a chess board at all. They would see only the various shaped pieces of wood, etc. The chess board which is seen in the seeing Oh, damn it. The chessboard which is seen is in the seeing, and not as such an object of sense perception, although it seems to be so at first, because we do not experience our participation in the process of perception, and, as explained above, experience ourselves as if we were onlookers, onlookers confronting a world which is out there separate from ourselves. What appears in the act of seeing is what it is, which is the chessboard in the above example. As Best says, 
Someone who suffers a total loss of memory does not as a consequence understand reality directly. On the contrary, he understands nothing. For example, he could no longer directly see a tree since he no longer knows what a tree is. Eliminating all concepts would therefore not achieve a direct encounter with the world. On the contrary, it will only achieve the end of the world. So that's, where, and that's my sort of answer to this. But I'm looking at it there, of course, in terms of the fact that there are levels of meaning. You might want to go to higher and higher and higher levels. So then you reach a level where you say, well, this is now, I do not have the meaning for this. So then you're like a person facing the giraffe who can't see the giraffe. So people say things like, I cannot see the meaning of life. Or everything seems so meaningless in our world. But in fact, our world is filled with meaning. So even to formulate that, as I said, I cannot see the, the meaning. I, our world seems so meaningless to us. That is a very meaningful thing to say. And you haven't noticed the meaning that's already there. Of course, that's not the meaning you want. And um, to bring, with, with the greatest respect... Um, she's going to tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> that's why she says that. I am, yeah. <laughs> um, meaning is only ever a possible point of view. And therefore is not the truth. Well, of course, I don't see it that way. I see meaning much more objectively. Um, because although it is true that it, always, it is always from a perspective, things appear from a perspective. And that in itself... Yeah, let me finish. Yeah. Things appear from a perspective. But it is things which appear from the perspective. So even though it's a perspective, it is the thing itself. Not the thing as it is in itself, but it is the thing itself which appears in that perspective. So although it is perspectival, and our grasp is perspectival, that does not mean that it's an illusion. What we grasp is real, but it's perspectively real, not absolutely real, as it would be if we could see things from no perspective at all. But that's an interpretation on reality. What is? What you've just said. To say that something is real. Well, I'm personally convinced that it's in the right direction, um, simply based on not only all the work I've done, but what other people do and say as well. I don't have this experience of this extreme subjectivism, which I know is, is very common, that um, everything is simply subjective. I don't see it that way. I, I do acknowledge that you've given us um, an introduction into bringing some muscle to how we arrive at meaning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, I can't go any further with this because you, no. you stated very clearly though, what you think and there isn't any, anything that I can say in response to that which would um, you make you think differently. Yeah, mm. thank you. Okay. Hello. <coughs> Who's next? Mine is just a follow-up question to Jess's question. I don't know. They okay, yeah. uh, You said about expression uh, that when on words, on language, and the, the expression came on here right now throughout the, the week, that even though it was through words, the expression came into being when we were, well, during the, the whole lectures. Uh, how does that work when it's on paper? When you're writing? No, when I'm reading. Yes. So, okay. in, in this case, you, I'm here with you, and the expression comes here right now for both, both of us, but yes. when I'm writing, it's like, I'm back into time, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, of course there's a temporal factor to it, because when you read, you're going along the lines. Yeah. You're not just going along the lines, though. You're not just taking it point by point by point. It's very interesting, actually. You could do the same exercise with the musical notes with reading. Um, and you'll see, uh, if you read up the bit I've mentioned to you, you'll be able to see how to apply that to reading itself. There is a temporality in reading, but it's not actually that analytical point by point by point by point. Because if it were, we could never sum it up to make experience. We could never do it. In fact, in reading, we're already ahead and also retaining. Not, it's not memory as such. There's a retaining and, a, and, a, and a going ahead. 
and, and those are out there simultaneously with the very point where we're at. It's, uh, it's very, the, 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 the present is not simply a punctual present, it has a kind of three dimensions to it, as, uh, and so on. Uh, so yes, time comes in there too. Now when you're reading, your problem is you want to understand something, and this can be very, very difficult. Now I've written, God, I mustn't talk about my own writing, uh, that uh, you could read a philosophical text and it may be very, very difficult, and you may puzzle over it and puzzle over it and puzzle over it. You may have to come back to it time and time again. And the point about it is these words don't seem to convey what it is you think that the writer is trying to convey, because what you see is these words. And these words can be very ordinary words. In fact, they're the same words as almost anyone else would use in a different circumstance. <coughs> so somehow or other, through working, you've got to reach the point where, as it were, that meaning can reach you. And that may take some time. And when you do, you, 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 it's like a door opening or a window opening. And say, oh, that's what it says. Uh, and now it appears. And you may get this uh, clearly, or you may get it indistinctly. Uh, you may then have to go back and read it again. Uh, there's one particular sentence that's used in a book on Merleau-Ponty, which I certainly can't remember. And I have to go back to the sentence time and time and time again. Because every time I've got it, I lose it again. It's like one of those, one of those uh, gestalt things. Um, and then it seems, if you really work with the work, it's almost as if when you're reading it, suddenly, I remember one man saying to me, the thing about reading Hegel's Science of Logic is you've got to read it like a newspaper. Like reading a newspaper. Well, it's so damn complicated, you try it. And he said, don't worry about the meaning, just plan through it like reading through a newspaper. Well, not quite like that, but there comes a point when reading it, when suddenly it's easy. And you're reading this text in front of you, and it's like there's another text over it. And that's what he's saying, and you're reading that. And you can see that that's there in the words. And you can also see that the words don't say it, because they didn't say it before. It's almost like there's a double text. There's, the t uh, but it's, there's only one text. Is that the words are there, and, and over it there's another text, which is what the, a meta text, which is what he's actually saying. And suddenly it's just like reading a newspaper. I've had this happen to me. You probably you have. We're quite complicated things, and suddenly you see it, and you realise, oh God, this is easy. Yes, that's what he's saying. And you're reading this stuff just like reading a newspaper. But then it's gone again. So, so it's like what you <coughs> before something. Uh, reading the spirit and not the yes. uh, letter? Yes, it is. But then you realize the spirit is real. Okay. It's not, you're, not you're not interpolating. It's actually real. This is actually what's being said. Uh, written language and literature has dimensions to it that we don't ordinarily understand. There, uh, there are higher possibilities in the use of written language than we realize. Um, I'm talking here about creative texts. Um, and most of the stuff we do today is so factual and so computer reduced, we're in danger of forgetting this. And this is a great shame. And I do wish that people had this experience I'm referring to more, because then they'd, they'd, they'd realize how extraordinary it is. It's a miracle how a, a, a man or a woman can use words which are actually common words and are used all the time and they use them, and suddenly through these words there comes something that hasn't been said before. It's actually a miracle. And this, this happens. Um, and that's part of this miracle of expression. I mean, I was thinking of it. I mean, I'm always thinking of having another chapter, but I was going to talk about the primacy of expression. I thought, no, I can't do that. Then I thought, why the hell don't I just call it the miracle of expression? Clearly, I can't do it. It's, it is when you see it. This is miraculous. And you know, there are dimensions in the lived experience which can't be represented in an external mechanistic manner at all. Um, and this is one of them. It, 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 it's amazing when you encounter <coughs> this. Does that help? Yeah, 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 it does. It does. Uh, yeah, I, I guess in. I, I was just thinking right now that 
in some way, you go back to the, the, the old saying that all paths lead to Rome. Yes. I'm guessing my path through time, hers through language, but we all point to the same yes. upstream kind of Yes, that is right. Thing. That is right. That is right. So yeah, yeah that's, that's absolutely pretty. right. It doesn't matter uh, which way you're going on. It'll all look different, but it isn't. It will lead the same way. And, and the point is that once you've got there, you can forget the rest. As Wittgenstein said, you climb up the ladder, when you've got on top, chuck the ladder away. Because he was saying to me, well, chuck my book away. If you've got it, chuck my book away, you've no need for it. Unfortunately, no one's managed to climb that ladder. Uh, this is the Tractatus Logical Philosophicus. No one seems to have climbed the ladder and been sure they're at the top. So instead of chucking the ladder away, people have written a very large number of books on it. <laughs> So that's it keeps people in business, doesn't it? Why don't you go ahead first? You've had that hand up for a while. Okay. <laughs> oh, I can't see you there. Ah. You know that's a trouble, Heather. You're you're, you're yeah. in the extreme left hand side of my life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so my question is sort of how to about how to use the ideas. You were talking about the um, the people, uh, the Human Genome Project people, and how you sort of saw it as sort of wasting 50 years, but you didn't have a problem with their doing what they were. Well, I didn't, it wasn't 50 years, was it? <coughs> you did say wasting 50 years. Well, I was exaggerating. Yeah, I know, but I'm just. <laughs> I have been known occasionally to exaggerate, yes. But, and so, like, as scientists, when we're exploring the world, how do we get to a state of being aware of the meaning rather than the object and applying that to scientific inquiry? Well, you're actually going to be doing this all the time. Uh, when you're trying to do something, what will actually happen is that you begin to experience meaning in what you're doing. Um, and you can only uh, do this by, by doing it. Uh, or let's take a simple example um, which I've also discussed in that book Galileo looked down a telescope and discovered there were mountains and craters on the moon and that there were little moons going around Jupiter well that sounds easy enough doesn't it he builds the telescope and he looks down it and hey look guess what folks there's mountains and craters on the moon looks like it's a sense experience doesn't it that this, uh, this, this, this comes down through the, through the telescope into his eyes and he sees mountains and craters and similarly with the satellites of Jupiter. But if you go and look at the book he wrote on this, it's called Siderius Nuncius. Siderius Nuncius, it means uh, the messenger of the stars, doesn't it? Sorry. Which, uh, it, it's actually light. Um, then you see that it, 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 it's not quite as simple as that. It was a very long-winded thing he had to go through to get to this. Because at first when you look, and people always say, oh, well, why didn't people believe Galileo? All they had to do was go and look down the telescope. So how bigoted they were, they refused to do that. But they didn't refuse to do it. They went and they looked down the telescope, and they couldn't see mountains of craters on the moon, and they couldn't see moons around Jupiter, because you have to learn to see that. And what happens is over time, uh, he describes that the moons is very good um, because he describes the observations over quite a long time and how he see, interprets those observations and then how he, he realises there's some pictures of them down there and then he realises that it doesn't fit and then he sees the meaning my God, I'm not looking at stars because he thought there was Jupiter and there were stars in the heavens near Jupiter. And those stars could have been well behind Jupiter or whatever, I don't know, but they just appear next to Jupiter. And he noticed that, uh, that, uh, that these stars, there was three on, three on the side of Jupiter. And then he got very strange because it then turned out that there's two on the side of Jupiter and one on the other side of Jupiter. And so, in fact, the, the observations became very confused. Until the day occurred to him that he wasn't looking at stars next to Jupiter. He was actually seeing things going around Jupiter. Now, that's an astonishing step to take. 
and there may be all sorts of other extra factors that helped him to take that step but there comes a time when he sees and that's the meaning so then he sees the meaning then he reports this and people treat it as if it were a sense experience which you would just have if you look and because you, you have to learn to look now the same thing happened for example with uh, her shells this is a good example discovery of the planet Uranus all the books will tell you how her shell built a bigger telescope than others and in a certain place in the heavens where he's expecting so, I don't know, I can't remember that, he discovered another planet everybody knows that but if we go and look at it we find he didn't discover a planet he published it and he said he discovered a comet he saw a comet and he described this comet and its movements well then people started to investigate this as, as, as normal and they over time realised that this comet wasn't moving in the right way to be a comet and a man called Lexel who no one's ever heard of said oh it's a planet but it, then it's all in the books that Herschel discovered the planet Uranus well he didn't he discovered a comet which wasn't there but that's the meaning he saw and then the, it, what you do is you test everything whatever you've got you must test it against experience all the time and Husserl is very big on this in philosophy test it, test it, test it this is science too and if it, if it, if it gets better and better and better then that's okay but it might turn out there are problems so you have to change and then say, well, what am I looking for? Oh, it's a planet, not a comet. And that comes through testing. It's not a God-given thing. It doesn't just fall out of a clear blue sky. And so that's a lovely example of how this kind of thing works in science. Um, does that help? Yeah. Is that what, it probably wasn't what you were looking for. But. You've still you've explained what it is more than how to get to... Oh, well, I mean, what do you do? You just do the work. <laughs> and there is no how. There is no, uh, <coughs> there's no method. There's no set of steps. You just do the work. And you will, you will because the mind will do is, the mind will always be searching for meaning. And you will get meaning. And then you test that meaning against whatever you can, the facts, if you like. Like, you have the, the movement of this heavenly body described as a comet you can actually test that and see how it's actually moving then you find it's not moving like a comet then now you know it can't be a comet you don't know what it is but it can't be a comet so what is it well uh, uh, maybe it comes that uh, uh, oh my god it's a planet um, which would have been a hell of a shock so, goes, so there's no procedure it's actually the procedure really the procedure in life the other thing is what can be said is <coughs> try to see things from as many perspectives as possible not just from one perspective because if you can see things from many, as many perspectives as you can then that actually can help to see what it is and that's quite a useful thing to try to do um the other thing to do is to produce variations. We did this with the work here on uh, Goethe's colour, with Brian's suggestion, it was brilliant. Make a variation and see what happens. Make a variation in your mind and see what happens. Um, so you take something like the colours um, on a border. If you take a border <coughs> like this. You take a border like that. Here, looking through a prism, you'll get red, orange, yellow. Here, looking through the prism, you'll get uh, light blue, dark blue, and so on and that. People vary with the names they call the colours. Um, and if you bring them together... Not that one there if you get the two there get those bring them together then you get green and so on 
Um, if you do that, then you get a certain order in the colours. Now, what Goethe discovered is that, that, that there is an order in the colours which is there in the very qualities of the colours. You don't go, as you do in physics, and say, yeah, well, there's an order because of the differences in the wavelengths. Because the wavelength actually is simply a number which you don't experience. And it doesn't tell you why red is red or why green is green. To say, oh, well, red is red because its wavelength is 6,500 angstroms, actually, to, to many people, they think you've explained it. You've not done anything at all. It does not give you the quality of redness. Though so with Goethe's approach, it's the quality of redness, the quality of yellowness, the quality of blueness, and how these qualities are related. And you go into this through observation and through exact sensorial imagination. Uh, this is what we were doing. And you get to a point where you realise that the order of the colours it actually has a, a direct meaning in terms of the quality of the colours themselves and the relation of light and dark. And you begin to experience this. So it's like there's a kind of lawfulness there, but it's a lawfulness in the quality, not in quantity. So it's not like quantitative, it's not x squared plus y squared equals z squared, it's not that kind of thing. And this is, this, you're actually working phenomenologically with this. It's actually very interesting for me, because the sort of thing I first got into Goethe, because I saw that what he did was the same as what Husserl and Stone did in phenomenology, only he was doing it in nature. Well, sometimes people find that they're so hung up on what they've learned at school that they can't sustain that. You have to put that on hold, like one of those fruit machines where you press a button and put cherries on hold, OK? You all, you all, you all know that, don't you? <laughs> I'm being frightfully modern here. And so you, you, put, you put it on hold. You have to put what you know on hold. And so you know all about wavelengths and this, that and the other. So you, no one says that's wrong, put it on hold. Some people find, found that very difficult to do. Brian came up with the idea that what we should do is visualise it and put the colours in the wrong order. That means, not wrong, the order in which they don't occur. So it goes, let's see, red, orange, yellow. So let's make it go red, blue, yellow. And then what we have to do, and that's, that's what's sort of called a variation. And then you visualise this as, as clearly as you can using the method I've already outlined. And you visualise it. And you have to do this. And when you go into this, uh, I've forgotten about all this. When you go into it, when you're working with this, you, when you visualise it, you go right into the colours. And remember now, we go back to red, orange, yellow. And you visualise yourself in those colours moving through red, to orange, to yellow. You actually experience yourself participating. You go into them, which means you bring them into you. And you experience yourself moving through the colours. And this is when you begin to experience that those colours are not just stuck together, they belong together. Belong. You don't have to make them belong together. You don't have to have to together them because they already belong and you begin to experience the belongingness and that's the wholeness in the colours and I call it in their unity which is bad uh, I call it unity without unification I shouldn't have done that it's actually the wholeness and um, you then re realise that some people found it hard to get to this so because of this background oh it's wavering so if you make it go red blue, yellow, and you really try to do this. But you have to have done all the experiments first. You can't just do it now. You've got to have gone through the whole stuff. Make it red, blue, yellow. Then, it, to the intellectual mind, oh, it's easy, no problem. These colours are just arbitrary anyway. Stick them in whichever order you want. So off you go. And people found this very strange experience. Um, because they couldn't get it to go. It felt wrong. And I remember one girl, I can't remember her name now, Oh, we're going back to the 1990s. And she said, oh, she gave a little squeak, and said, oh, it keeps jumping out. Every time I put it there, it jumps out. Which is brilliant, because this is a phenomenon. Because it wouldn't go, because it doesn't go, because it doesn't belong there. And so in this way, why the hell am I talking about this? I've forgotten what I'm talking about. Why am I talking about this? 
Yeah. Is that how? What? That how she asked? Yeah. Oh, methodology. Methodology, yes. By making a variation and doing something which is actually not possible, then in fact that way you begin to come through to the to the phenomenon that really is possible and begin to really experience the meaning that actually this is the wholeness. Does that make any sense? Have I confused you all with that example? No. no. It just began to come back to me. And I thought, well, I've forgotten about doing all that. Yeah, but it's brilliant. As people then all agreed that actually, that's right, they're red, orange, yellow, and that's not arbitrary, and it's not good enough just to say, well, that's because of the wavelengths. It actually is there in the phenomenon itself, that order, which you can experience. I hope you'll get... get one needs to do this. I'll be doing it later. Oh, I've ruined it then. <laughs> oh no, you've, you've, you've put new dimensions into it. Oh. We've, we've gone ahead. I didn't know you did this. I usually do that. Oh, excellent. Mm. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I no, wouldn't no, have said no. all that if I'd known. No, that's good. Let's hope they forget. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't have said all that. Sported. But no, it'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that you did that. Yeah, well, that's an example of how you can use a variation, mm. and then it, the phenomenon tells you that that doesn't fit. So that's important. But there are other variations where you are actually taking different perspectives, and as I was saying earlier, that when you take a perspective of something, it is actually a perspective of something. It is that something which is showing through that perspective. It's not the complete thing, because you're only getting it perspectively. What you're getting is the thing itself. As I said, not the thing as it is in itself, which would be the God's eye view, but the thing itself is appearing perspectively. So if you take more perspectives, then you could actually see more of it until it becomes clear what it is. That's another way to work. Does that help? Yeah. So there are things you can do, it turns out. First of all, I said you can do but there are things, aren't there, that you can do. Mm. Do we have time for more questions? Unfortunately, we've got <laughs> more time. <laughs> <laughs> It's only 25 to 1. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, okay. Yes. I, I keep uh, coming back to this, um, to the potency to be otherwise, and just how uh, uh, crucial and integral that is to, to, um, to life, to, uh, to healthy human beings, to healthy systems, to healthy uh, organizations. Um, and I've been thinking of it uh, kind of, uh, and you can tell me if this analogy is off base, but kind of as a as a chess game. And uh, one, you know, let's say let's say uh, the white side represents a, a certain organ or uh, organism or person or whatnot, and the other side represents all the. the the surrounding environment, the, all the various stimuli, uh, and, the, and um, that uh, uh, um, uh, as you as you move through time, uh, um, well, step, take, take a step back. That um, a good chess player, it seems to me, is good because they maintain the potency to be otherwise throughout the game. They, they know how to position the pieces in a way that they have maximum flexibility um, with coherence throughout throughout the game. Um, and so it seems to me that there that, that uh, one of the things we really need as individuals and as a species is to um, is to really uh, accentuate uh, our capacity to, to, you know, for potency to be otherwise, and I wonder if any in any of your uh, work with organizations and whatnot, th there are general principles uh, or techniques or something that you've you've 
shared uh, uh, that can help develop that capacity. I don't know if that's making sense. Well, the chess thing is obviously quite a good picture. I quite liked that. Um, but then you refer to my work with organizations, to which I can only say, what organizations? Uh, I think you, well, I, I was extrapolating a bit, but you mentioned many years ago you were working with, with IBM and some other organizations. Yeah, that was 1972. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, that's me to remember. <laughs> um, well, I guess I'll put it a different way. Are, are there uh, lessons from, from, for example, Goethe's work with, with uh, organs, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, ur organ, um, that, that we can kind of draw and, and implement in our own lives and how we work as groups? Uh, first of all, uh, what I was saying to Heather uh, was already things you can do to increase flexibility. Um, this method of variation increases flexibility. Increasing the perspectives you take will increase flexibility. Um, all these kinds of things uh, have that effect. Seeing things from a different point of view, therefore, is very important. Um, because, or attempting, or trying to see things from a different point of view. Because that point of view is not, in my view, is not actually subjective. It is subjective in the sense that it's a point of view, and we are, we are this is a dimension we haven't got into yet, I'm not going to go into, but fundamentally, uh, subjectivity can only see from points of view. Um, but in fact, what is seen is, is the thing itself, the thing from that point of view, so you are seeing the thing. So you can actually increase the points of view. And you may take points of view which are quite different to your own and try to see in that way. This will certainly increase flexibility. And again, as I say, this method of variation where you, you explore, you, you make experiments in your mind, like the one with the colour, and you then find that things don't fit. And then you get the real strong sense that they don't fit because they don't fit. And then you can begin to get a sense of the belonging together of things and you can also begin to tell the difference between belonging together and, and your attempt to together things into belonging. Mm -hmm. So you can explore all of that. And it is, there, 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 there's, there's, a, there's more in what I've just said there than meets the eye, because actually, if you start working with it, you'd be surprised how much will come out of these apparently small, small almost, almost trivial things. It might seem trivial that I've said, but as I'm saying them, I'm actually thinking of the phenomenological background and what they lead to behind. So really, I mean, I mean it. Now, with regard to organisations, um, I'm out of it. But um, there is a book which um, I'm in two minds about. I've recommended it to people, and they say they don't like it because they don't like this, that, and the other. But you've mentioned organisations, so here we go. It's a book called Presence. Have you come across it? Uh, by... Oh, well, I've got this bit here. Hang on a minute. I'll just get the, Yeah, I'll just get the whole thing there. Hang on. Hang on. As, I'll just get this. See if I can find it. Conveniently, it just happened to be on the first table I came to. Uh, it's not, this isn't the book. But, um, it's called Presence Exploring Profound Change in People, Organisations, and Society. And it's by Senger, that's the famous Peter Senger. Otto Sharma, S C H A R M E R, Jaworski, Joseph Jaworski, J A W O R S K I, and Flowers, that's Betty Sue Flowers. And it is about change in people, organisations, and society. 
And uh, I didn't mention it before, but I mentioned now, it does actually start off by referring to my own work on wholeness in this paper and an interview he did with me, which is on the, on the famous internet. Um, now, I didn't know about this book, but well, I found out about it by accident, and it, I was quite shocked because it had my, my stuff in it and so on and that. But uh, it's fine. Um, it, it, it's actually uh, it's an illustration of what can be done with counterfeit and authentic holes. And I was quite fascinated because it goes back to organisations, which is where this had actually been originally written in that, that context. Because, uh, and so on. Uh, and there, he does go into things in a way which would answer quite a lot of your questions. Now, I've recommended this book to people, and I never get any feedback. Um, I don't think people here like it. Because although they're too polite to say so, they don't like organisations. Um, so I think that's a problem at Schumacher College. I, think that I mentioned it in the literature, because actually it's to do with business organisations, and they don't like business organisations, which is a prejudice. Is that unfair of me, is it? Is it, is it the learning company you prefer? Huh? No. Learning company. No, no, no. It's Peter Singh. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to this book only. And I think it's, there are people here who are against. We do have the books. Yeah, but there are people here who are against organisations. <laughs> and one of the people who is very much against them has left. Uh, and that's why I'm doing this course, because he did this course. Do you remember? No. Anyway, it's just as well. So, um, and then I make. It, it's also a bit new agey. Um, but these the people, college or the book? <laughs> the book. Um, these people know what they're doing. They're all experienced people. But it, is, it can be taken as being new agey. And so other people I've recommended it to have come back to me and said, I'm very surprised that you were recommending a book that's so, so new agey. But I thought you didn't like the new age. Well, I don't. But actually, uh, this book is a bit new agey. But it, what's in it is actually quite good. Uh, and there are some things I don't like about parts of it, but that's it. I actually think in terms of the whole and the part, there's an awful lot of terrific stuff in it. And it does have in it, in effect, um, the kind of thing you were talking about, which is what kind of things that you could kind of techniques and organisations, wouldn't you? Mm. Yes. I mean, it's pretty good. It starts off with Everything we have to say in presence starts with understanding the nature of wholes and how parts are interrelated. Our normal way of thinking cheats us. It leads us to think of wholes as made up of many parts. The way a car is made up, blah, blah. In this way of thinking, the whole is assembled from the parts, etc. And so on and so on. Then, for Goethe, he goes to Goethe, the whole was something dynamic and living that continually comes into being in concrete manifestations which actually is a reference to me, footnotes a reference to me. A part in turn was a manifestation of the whole rather than just a component of it. The whole exists through continually manifesting in the parts and the parts exist as embodiments of the whole. Then he, the, and they said, Bortov says the part is a place of presence in the whole. It's all based on this. Now, what happened was, I didn't know about this, but what happened was, um, I got this phone call years ago uh, my wife was in Africa at the time and I got this phone call one Saturday morning from this man who was obviously American but had a, a European and German accent who came down the phone at me into my kitchen where I was and wanted to speak to Henry Bortoft and I didn't really like the sound of this man and so I, I said to him and he said something about who he was and, and I said well unfortunately Henry Bortoft's not here <laughs> And he said, where is he then? So I said, well, he said, tell me where he is, I'll contact him. Wherever he is, you give me a contact address, I'll contact him. Uh, and I said, well, unfortunately, you, you can't contact him because he's, he's camping at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, tell me which campsite. Oh, and I said, well, actually, it's not a proper campsite. <laughs> He's camping in a field. <laughs> and he said, well, when will we be back? 
And he said, will he be back in a week's time? Well, I was getting muddled up now. So I said, yes, yes, he'll be back in a week's time. I'll call next Saturday at the same time. <coughs> well, he did. And at this point, I got muddled up. Because I thought, hang on a minute. Um, oh, I told him I was, I told him it was his brother speaking, that's right. He said, who is, I said, oh, it's Henry Borsos brother. And then when he called the next Saturday, I realised I'd got a problem. Because now I was Henry Bortoft. And so I thought, well, I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to be Henry Bortoft's brother. I know, I'll do what they do in those old films. Because <laughs> I took my hands and I put it, and I talked on the phone and took my hands <laughs> And then at one point I realised I'd got it the wrong way round. You see, it was my brother that should have. I should have had it to my brother, not for me. So I, I really got it a terrible mess. Anyway, then he said he wanted to interview me. Of course, I said, well, I don't do interviews, which is true. Um, but anyway, he went on and on. And this guy, um, he wore me down. Uh, but what he then said, and this, this, he never knew, I never told him. He said, well, it's a great pity because I'm going to be in London next week and I thought we could meet in the Ritz for tea. And whole that I am. <laughs> I, what, what he did not know was that I'd always wanted to have tea in the Ritz. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, so I said, well, I suppose that's possible. And we met in the Ritz for tea. Oh. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he interviewed me um, and what I remember was the quality of the sandwiches was poor the cream cakes were exceptional but the main thing was there was a chap playing the piano and it was lovely it was an afternoon kind of slight jazzy music and it, it was beautiful so we had this interview and he said well he was going to publish not publish his he was doing lots of interviews with people like Varela and all sorts of people like, who were famous. I wasn't famous. Um, <coughs> what had happened was that I, I discovered later that Senga had come across this paper or something like that. Anyway, I don't know. But anyway, um, he, 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 they were going to put a dossier of these things and he'd send them to, to me. And then that, he did send me something and I had to check it and that was, that was another thing that was dreadful because um, he, he sent me this interview and I got it when I was in Scarborough at Christmas just before Christmas, and I was in a great rush because I had to get a plane to Zimbabwe. All this stuff, and being, being an American influence, he wanted it back yesterday and he wanted me to correct it. And I thought, I can't work like that. So I did something I'd never done before. I took it to the pub. And so I'll go and have a drink in the pub. So I'll, I, I, I'll, that means I won't focus on it too much. So I'm working through this. I got about a third way through it. Someone comes in and says, hello, Henry. It's a friend of mine from Spain I haven't seen for years. Anyway, we left the pub at closing time. It was him and his wife and six bottles of wine. And he said, I've got a couple of pheasants in the oven. Would you like to come back? So I went back to his, I left his house at three o'clock in the morning. And I had to post this stuff off to Sharma the following morning. So what I did was I just put it in the post without correcting it. Because I just haven't got time. And I thought, well, that's it. Nothing's going to happen. So he sent this to me in Zimbabwe when I actually wanted it not sent in Zimbabwe. And there it remained because I left it there because when I left, my problem was getting out of Zimbabwe because of the war veterans who were stopping people on the roads to the airport. And I was really worried about them. The last thing on the earth I was bothered about was these interviews from, from MIT. So it just got moulding somewhere in Zimbabwe. But two or three years later, um, someone said to me, do you know you're on the internet? And I didn't, of course, because they didn't look at that. And there, if you Google Henry Bortoff, the there's, there's, there's this interview up there, yeah. oh, which I didn't know about. And then one day I was looking, I thought I'd better buy Stefan's book. And uh, so I looked on Amazon, and it said those people who found this book also found this book. And it said presents. I thought, oh, that's interesting, presents. And he said, Sharma. I thought, oh, show me. And then I, <laughs> and I realised this book contained in it the stuff that I'd done with him. And so I bought the book, and then I found and all this. So that was an example of how reluctant one can be to do something, but somehow or other it still happens. So there we are. And well, I tell that story because I'd like to get us closer to lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, you know, there are some good things in that book, 
And I don't care whether you don't like organisations or you don't like New Asian, there are some good things in it. And um, it's worth reading, particularly what he has to say about the way the future comes into influence. A presence, he, he says, he, he, there's a bit of a muddle here because he thought presence, presence came from Goethe. And I'm responsible for this because it doesn't. And it actually came from Heidegger. And I described Goethe in Heidegger's terms. But anyway, that, that, that's, that's irrelevant, isn't it? So that's how that happened. Yes. Carry on. Okay, so I'll try to ask a question in a, as clear way as possible. So if we approach world in the way that you've explained this week, we will encounter a dynamic world. I can't I'll, I'll, uh, and then um, if we start to see um, if we start to see uh, things differently we might encou encounter something that we don't want to see and if there's something that we don't want to see what would we do? That's my first question. Huh? Second question is, um, is there a dynamic unity in the quality of human beings? In the quality? I don't know. I've, I don't know. I don't know the answer to either question. Sorry, I've got a, I've got an aura coming in my eye. I can't see properly. It's um, it's the um, that's again I've heard. I'm just having us come on. Yeah. Yeah. Can you do that, Tom? Okay. Leave that off. Yeah. Um. you see something you don't want to see, is that what you said? Is that what the first part was? Yes. Well, you could, it'd have to be a bit more specific. Um, I mean, it's a bit, a bit general, isn't it? Like, let's say, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to have a different relationship with the world. Yeah. In a more, more dynamic way. And so, if you if you, if you want to make it more specific, what do I what do I so what if let's but, so if we start to if I start let's say if I start to feel the pain of the earth if I don't want to feel it because it's too painful, do you need a lot? What would I do? Go to the pub. <laughs> what is the next question? <laughs> And also, if you know, we've, we've talked a lot about dy dynamics, and I was interested in our own dynamics. What dynamics? Our, our, our own, yeah. the dynamics of yeah, human of course, beings. Yeah. And if we start to feel the dynamics of, of whatever that we're dealing with, what the what is there? Uh, I, I just wanted to know what I have as a human being, and then if there is a, a dynamic unity in in the quality of our our beings, in yeah. human beings. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, well, I don't myself like to try to answer questions about human beings and so on and that, because I don't want to give any hint of any suggestion that I understand this kind of thing any better than you do, um, or anyone else. I'm not that sort of person. Um, there are people who will happily expound on this kind of thing, but it doesn't necessarily mean they know what they're talking about. Um, when it comes to these kind of questions, we're all in the same boat. But there is one thing, and I, I can't quite remember it, but the, the, the whole tendency is in, the, in European philosophy, I'll stick to that because that's what I'm dealing with, the whole tendency is to stop thinking in terms of entities that do things. But to simply think in, think of of um, uh, think of simply uh, the kind of action that they're actually doing doing things without having to think of an entity that, that does it. It's um, that it was put to me this this way once. Uh, you've got to stop thinking in terms of beings that do and start to think instead in terms of doings that be and that's I would say the attitude to take and if we look at it a lot of the time we actually think of ourselves as a being that's doing and that, the dynamic approach is to see this, this action which bees and we, we are that act we are the act which bees and we're being ourselves. We are. We talk about. I want to be myself. We are being ourselves. Um, but don't get caught upon the self. What we really are is the act. And that's why. That in that sense, we are intrinsically dynamic. We're not actually entities at all. But we are. Well, we are act. Now this comes out very clearly in certain aspects of. It's very clear in Heidegger and so on and all that. And the reason why people can't understand his descriptions, because this is actually how he's describing it. And they're trying to think of it in terms of beings that do. And this doing, it's, it's well, just, you understand what I mean? Doings that be. We are, we are doing. We are act, which beings. And that's, that, that's the dynamic. And that's how we should approach ourselves. Does that help? So... Is that the dynamic unity? Well, it is dynamic, isn't it? Yeah, it's dynamic, isn't it? And don't worry about the unity, it'll take care of itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to say, at one point, come back to that. I can't remember now. I used to say, the way I say that. Um, yeah. If you get the dynamics right, the wholeness will take care of itself. Because I say this in this course here because this is when I realised that you, if, I used to say, if you focus on wholeness, that's fine. But eventually it'll go, it'll go wrong. What you have to do is go past the wholeness to the dynamics. But when you get the dynamic of the coming into being, you find the wholeness is there. So if you get the dynamics, the wholeness takes care of itself. So you don't, in this case, the unity takes care of itself. And then you'll see what it is, and you don't have to worry about it. It's a question of getting the dynamics right which matters. I guess the reason why I'm asking you this question is that I want to, to um, have a I have a strength to to be a whole, I guess, and I just wanted to know where, what is it that I want to see as a strength in my being? Well, I can't answer that because um, I, 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 I don't really understand what you're saying there because it's very personal, isn't it, for you? Um, but um, 
I mean, I can't, I, I, I can't, get, I can't get my head around that one. Um, I, 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 it seems like that really, the, the quote you read really speaks to those kinds of questions you're asking that are about your own, your being in relation to everything else. It's like you kind of just have to keep on living and inquiring, and eventually something will coalesce, maybe. Yes, I mean, I, I think, I think, I certainly think that's true. Um, I, I don't understand what, what I don't understand what strength you're, you're referring to. I mean, let's, um, <coughs> should we all thank Henry? Yeah. I think it's been absolutely fantastic. Yeah, yeah, this yeah week. Exactly. And Henry doesn't come to many places, but when he comes, it's like he's every place arriving here. Uh -huh. <laughs> That was understandable. And tonight we are going to the pub. So at about 8 or 8.30. Are we? Yeah. Which pub? No, the cot. If you'd like to come. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. No, that, that, that we said that at the morning meeting. Oh, I wasn't there. Yeah. I don't go to the morning yeah. meeting. I'm too busy trying to mm. hold myself together for the day. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's always a kind of Friday disintegration that you can kind of let go of wholeness in this great effort. Oh, I'm very pleased about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at the moment, I can't see out the side at all. No. It's all right. Which is also why I'm having great difficulty with the questions, because right. I can't... Uh, I just <coughs> have this stuff now, yeah. and, I, and that's it. Um, yes, well, that's an excellent idea. Right. Uh, but thank you very much. Um, I have enjoyed working with you. Um, I, I say this co completely truthfully. Um, I know the kind of work that I do, it can only be done in certain circumstances. And it requires certain kinds of people with certain kinds of orientation, certain kinds of situation, and then it can be done. And this is such a place. But it depends on the quality of the people and how far you can go. And it's been very noticeable to me on several occasions this week that I have been able to push things, when I say push things, things have opened up, is what I mean to say, in a certain way, which is a reflection of the quality of the people. And so I'm actually very grateful to you for all that you have done for your contribution and the extraordinary quality of attention that you have brought to it. So thanks ever so much. I'll see you in the pub. Thank you.